Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless you know things used to be a little simpler back in the day a lot simpler you used to know what your kids were learning in school even in sex ed each of us is different from the day we're born no two people are exactly alike some of those differences are inherited from our parents see i said so then at puberty certain glands begin to work and our bodies begin to change. What's puberty? Well, puberty, well, puberty's a lot of things. Mainly, though, it's a time of change. For you, it means your bodies are changing from boys to men. If sex was ever taught in the classroom, it was mostly clear cut. Sure, Dad still had to sit you down and give you the good old birds and bees talk. But that was the point. Parents had control over their kids and their minds. The book of Proverbs lays it out Plainly, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he's old, he will not depart from it. It's our job. But today, that biblical truth has been turned upside down because parents are being replaced by an agenda. I told all my students that my pronouns are they, them, and that my honorific is mix. I teach in an explicitly trans-affirming high school. Um, we have gender support plans. We have a gender-affirming wardrobe at our school. With my students being second graders, I had to make sure that my um, lesson was um, appropriate for that age group. I explained that it could be a boy that's a girl, a girl that's a boy, or someone who feels like neither. Now, why I felt okay sharing this was because I, they know that I identify as neither. I go by mix. What's happening in the classrooms has become an assault on boys and girls, moms and dads, on families. The radical left has intentionally destroyed the innocence of kids by hypersexualizing them, confusing them on topics that are difficult enough for adults, let alone kids who are already otherwise confused and finding their way. Instead of learning wisdom and logic and phonics, in history, kids in our government school system are learning that being white makes you the bad guy. Being cisgender, otherwise known as straight, is so last decade, just not cool anymore. And if you think there's an end to it, look at what our kids are getting on their phones. Hi, I'm Cody. I primarily go by eat M or Z's on pronouns, but I'm comfortable being referred to using any neo pronouns that are not Z here. Void self pronouns are neo pronouns inspired by the word void and they can be used by anyone regardless of gender identity my name is horace and i'm a red-tailed hawk i am in a human body but my identity is still a hawk sometimes i'm literally trans and sometimes i'm literally not like because in my gender fluidity like i just it just is like sometimes i'm trans and sometimes i'm not i'm always non-binary between schools and phones, our children are being brainwashed into believing that being rebellious or unique or interesting or different means changing your gender identity or using made-up pronouns. They're being sucked into a culture of grievance where self-identity and victimhood make, takes the place of basic biological truths. If you're a teenage high school girl who's uncomfortable with a biological boy in your locker room, you could get mauled. Two students arguing at Martin Luther King High School. It's unclear who started the fight, but the tall student is said to be trans. There's pushing and shoving, and eventually another student jumps in and fists fly. <laughs> Adding fuel to the fire, rumors of the trans student's behavior. And then he's also in the girls' locker room using girls' restrooms. He spit on my friends that are girls, females, and uh, he, he shows his genitals in the, the locker room. So, you can either accept the critical gender theory groupthink of 15 minutes ago and follow the herd, or you become the outlier. And we've already, we're already seeing what this kind of culture does to our kids. We are reaping what the left has sown. Brand new tonight, a study by the CDC, this is the Center for Disease Control, says that one in four high schoolers identify as lesbian, gay, or bisexual. 
almost 25% of American kids between the ages of 14 and 18. Let that soak in. 25% of high schoolers in America. It's a staggering number. That number has more than doubled since 2015 when it was just 11%. By the way, 2015 is when they even started asking the question. We saw the biggest spike come between 2020 and 2021, up 8% in those two years. Now, that same study shows that only 2.4% of these kids have had sexual contact with only the same sex. So the number of gay and lesbian students in America today probably hasn't changed much. But kids' views of their identity has changed in warp speed. Kids are being socially conditioned to think that there are any number of fluid genders. You heard it. It's being taught. And based on what the left is doing in our schools, this number will only go up from 25%. This is a social contagion, a civilizational crisis unleashed on our most precious gift, our innocent children. But this is the inevitable outcome of a 100-year progressive takeover a topic we have tackled for two seasons on the miseducation of America on Fox Nation. Activists slowly began to deconstruct and recruit more and more young people into believing the Christian views held by their parents were archaic and not fit for the modern industrial age. Ultimately, the most effective institution in destroying potential families is unsurprisingly responsible for planning the first steps toward America's sex education. Planned Parenthood has been involved from day one with pushing the sexualized agenda into America's schools. Simply put, over 100 years, this is what happens when we rip God out of our schools and put the God of the state and their science in charge of the schoolroom. Our kids become the experiments. So we can't say we're surprised when the National Education Association, the NEA, endorses Joe Biden for president. Well, they only endorse Democrats, always have, since 1976 when they bestowed their first endorsement on Jimmy Carter. Now, Carter turned around and gifted the unions a new Department of Education. In the decades that followed, the federalization of American education was complete. Then, in 2020, Biden completely handed the keys to the teachers' unions, and we saw what they did with it. Now, he's ready to do it again. There's no such thing as someone else's child. No such thing as someone else's child. Our nation's children are all our children. So if you think 25% of high school kids identifying as gay, lesbian, and bisexual is a high number, well, that is just the beginning. Their goal, which they openly talk about, is to push radical gender and sexual curriculum into younger and younger grades. They won't stop until they reach pre-K. Joe Biden and his union member wife, Jill Biden, the doctor, are happy to accelerate that for them. With that plan in full motion, what's next? How does all of this impact future relationships, marriages, the family, our country? The current state of family breakdown in America is already at crisis levels. And now we're about to find out how much worse it can get. To paraphrase a gospel truth from the book of Matthew, woe to anyone who causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble. Those are words to ponder. Proverbs 29.2, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. It's official. President Biden has released a video ad announcing he's seeking re-election. Let's finish this job. I know we can. Because this is the United States of America. There's nothing, simply nothing we cannot do if we do it together. If he wins re-election, he'll be 82 years old when he's sworn in for a second term. Biden's age, of course, is a big concern for most Americans. But it was this comment that he made in the Rose Garden honoring Teachers of the Year that got my attention. He was quoting a former school teacher. Rebecca put a teacher's creed into words when she said, there's no such thing as someone else's child. No such thing as someone else's child. Our nation's children are all our children. It reminded me of what Hillary Clinton said at the 1996 Democratic Convention. Remember that? To raise a happy, healthy, and hopeful child. It takes all of us. Yes. It takes a village.
No, Mrs. Clinton, no President Biden. Children don't belong to the government, and it doesn't take a village to raise them. It just takes committed parents. But folks, too many parents aren't raising their children well. And that's why politicians think children are the government's responsibility. When there's a void, the government is eager to step in to fill it. Fathers are absent from the home. Nearly 70% of African-American children are now born into single-parent households. And overall, one of every four kids in America is growing up without a father. That's shocking, isn't it? More shocking is the result. Society and the nuclear family are being destroyed. Deadbeat dads, fathers not paying child support, have left many single moms with no choice but to work long hours or more than one job just to survive. Exhausted at the day's end or always working, many of them are less involved in their kids' lives. And we wonder why young males are becoming trans or shooting up schools and shopping centers. They lack positive godly male influence in their lives. Godly fathers in the home who give boys discipline and teach them respect and responsibility. Without that, they have no direction, no hope. Folks, let's pray that America returns to God's model for families. Only through his wisdom, guidance, and direction will we obtain the hope that America's children and all of us need for a brighter and more prosperous future. God created the family. His design was for a man and a woman to marry for life and raise children to know and honor him, as we read in Mark 10, 6-9. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Children are a gift from God, and he cares about how they are raised. Proverbs 23, 13, and 14. Do not withhold correction from a child, for if you beat him with a rod, he will not die. You shall beat him with a rod and deliver his soul from hell. When God led the Israelites out of bondage, he commanded them to teach their children all he had done for them, as we read in Deuteronomy 6, 6 and 7. And these words, which I command you today, shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. God desired that the generations to come would continue to uphold all his commands. When one generation fails to instill God's laws in the next, a society quickly declines. Parents have not only a responsibility to their children, but an assignment from God to impart his values and truth into their lives. God disciplines his children, as we read in Hebrews 12, 5 through 7. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? God expects earthly parents to discipline their children as well, as we read in Proverbs 13, 24. He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. Children are a heritage from the Lord, as we read in Psalm 127, 3. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. The goal of good parenting is to produce wise children who know and honor God with their lives. Proverbs 23, 24 shows the end result of raising children according to God's plan. The father of the righteous will greatly rejoice, and he who begets a wise child will delight in him. Failure to discipline results in dishonor for both parent and child, as we read in Proverbs 10, 1. A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is the grief of his mother. Proverbs 15.32 says, He who disdains instruction despises his own soul, but he who heeds rebuke gets understanding. The Lord brought judgment upon Eli the priest because he allowed his sons to dishonor the Lord and failed to restrain them, as we read in 1 Samuel 3.13. For I have told him that I would judge his house 
forever for the iniquity which he knows, because his sons made themselves vile, and he did not restrain them. God tells us what happens if we forget his law in Hosea 4.6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being priests for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. Because America has rejected God's knowledge and forgotten his law, it seems as though God has forgotten our children. How do you strengthen and preserve manhood, masculinity, families in this country? Uh, you, you spoke yesterday at a stronger men's conference in Missouri and talked about manhood in America today. Here's a portion of what you said. No matter how you feel, no matter how the last few months have gone for you or the last few years, your life is a life of influence. Your life is a life of significance, and God wants to use you to do something that he won't use anybody else for. He has something for you that he doesn't have with anybody else. He has called you to a specific task and purpose in this day and in this hour, and the world needs it because he's chosen you to do it. I, you gave, from what I understand, about a 45-minute speech about men and their responsibility in America. Talk to me about why this is a topic, uh, so something you're so passionate about. You know, if you just look at the statistics, just look at the number of men in America who say they're suffering from depression, all-time highs. Look at the number of men in America who are suffering from drug abuse and alcohol abuse, all-time highs. Look at the number of men in America committing suicide, all-time highs. There is no doubt that we have a crisis of purpose for men, especially young men in this country, and we just need to call these men to something higher. Listen, yesterday I just talked about what the Bible has to say about why men are important. You know, God has a purpose for men and women in this world. By the way, those are two separate things. You know, there are men and there are women, and they're different, and God has a purpose for each one of us, and each one of us as a man and as a woman. The Bible teaches us that there is a hierarchy that is to be followed, as we read in 1 Corinthians 11.3. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. The Bible teaches us that although males and females are equal in relationship to Christ, the scriptures give specific roles to each in marriage. The husband is to assume leadership in the home. This leadership should not be dictatorial, condescending, or patronizing to the wife, but should be in accordance with the example of Christ loving the church, as we read in Ephesians 5, 25 through 28. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Christ loved the church with compassion, mercy, forgiveness, respect, and selflessness. In the same way, husbands are to love their wives. Wives are to submit to the authority of their husbands, as we read in Ephesians 5.22-24. through 24. Wives, submit to your own husbands, as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. A believing woman who is seeking to obey God should remember that she has equal access to all spiritual blessings in Christ, as we read in Galatians 3.28. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Men and women have a God-given privilege to fulfill the plan He has set for us. Rebellion against that plan and the arrogance that seeks to put self above God's word brings difficult consequences. We see those consequences in the destruction of the relationship between husbands and wives, the destruction of the family, and the loss of respect for human life. And we just talked about this at this conference. 10,000 men from all over the country gathered to worship God, to hear about how they can be better fathers, better husbands, how they can go out and lead in their communities. I mean, it, it was just awesome to be part of. Men want that purpose, and the country needs it. The country needs the men of this nation to step up, and that's really what we talked about. There is no better example of real manhood than Jesus Christ. Christ's example, as given in the Bible, shows us how to express male traits in a positive way. Jesus was unafraid to show his emotions over the death of Lazarus, as we read in John 11, 35 and 36. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. Jesus 
was also willing to chase crooks out of the temple with a whip, as we read in John 2, 13-16. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple, with the sheep and the oxen, and poured out the changers' money, and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Christ had compassion for others, as we read in Matthew 15:32 and verses 35 through 37. Now Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, I have compassion on the multitude, because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And I do not want to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. So he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and the fish and gave thanks, broke them, and gave them to his disciples. And the disciples gave to the multitude. So they all ate and were filled. And they took up seven large baskets full of the fragments that were left. Jesus demonstrated forgiveness. Luke 7, 44-48 Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven? The same loves little. Then he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. Jesus demonstrated humility. John 13, 12 through 17. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Jesus demonstrated bravery, love, and extreme generosity. John 3, 16 and 17 For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Not only did Jesus give his life to save all of mankind, he endured the most horrendous beating beforehand. Jesus gave everything he had to bring humanity back into right relationship with God, which is the most generous gift of all. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is Accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation 
does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.